I see, I can't even say the word, to relationship rebellion with me, Sorrel Printer, and my lovely partner, Mark de Geitelink. And if anyone is here, please put something in the comments so that we know we have company, because otherwise we will think that we're speaking to the void. And I will repeat this request later on in the in the show, because people join at any, any old time, don't they? So today, Mark and I are going to talk about communication. And I have made a lot of effort to speak clearly. Because I know that it can be very irritating to listen to somebody who mumbles. Isn't it, Mark? Well, it's just like listening to a telephone that keeps cutting out. Is that what it's like? Yes. Okay. And so you get sort of, ooh, interesting, followed by gobbledygook, followed by interesting, followed by... More gobbledygook. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's... Um, Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we have to work on that, don't we? Because I'm the one who mumbles. Anyway, that wasn't really what we were going to talk about. We were going to talk about the um, common misconception that it's very important to communicate in a relationship. And there's some truth in that, because sometimes it is helpful. But it's not helpful if you're in a foul mood. And so... <laughs> It's not, I don't understand why this isn't blindingly obvious to the entire human race, but apparently it isn't. So if I'm in a bad mood, I mean a really bad mood, which doesn't happen very often, does it? Does it? No. no. But sometimes I am. And I say something about something that's bothering me about Mark, it will probably be A, inaccurate, and B, rude, and C, very, not, not at all loving. And it's probably a D, but I don't know what it is. And it will be counterproductive. And it won't, it won't achieve anything except to make him, him cross with me, which I don't want to happen, really. However, if I'm in a good mood and I'm happy, I still wouldn't be rude to you. Do you know, I think one of the skill sets for a half-decent relationship is knowing what condition your partner is in. And so when you start yeah. talking to me in that way, I just know that you're having a bit of a dodgy moment. And that I'm not supposed yes. to take it seriously or even listen to half of it. I mean, I'll wait until until the moment has passed. Until a more civil soz turns up. Because yes. because you know, people talk all kinds of nonsense for all kinds of reasons that you can't see. They might be hungry, they might be in pain, they might be distracted, they might need a poo. They might also need a glass of water. They this might. Is actually green tea yes. in a green mug. Um so it's kind of two things, really. It's on both sides of the relationship, there's the person delivering the communication in a bad mood and then there's a person on the other side recognizing that do you know what there's that famous saying from mark tyrrell who i think is a psychotherapist who said an angry professor is no more clever than a two-year-old child in fact possibly less clever than a two-year-old so you when you're angry you're not going to say anything clever no and so if your partner knows well just don't take it seriously because she's angry or she's upset or she's irritable which happens quite often um then it makes a huge difference doesn't it well i think it's just dealing with human beings i mean they're not reliable no we're not they're reliable not reliable they're not consistent they're likely to be very very groovy one minute and five minutes later it's entirely a different creature absolutely and so if one has a and that is also true for the self so yes absolutely because yeah because we don't we can't depend on ourselves to be Dependable all the time, can we? No, and this, and if if we think of ourselves in that way, we stop supervising ourselves. That's true. So once one recognises that one is a frail human being, which is going to be a bit unreliable here and there, you just have this default check your voice before you let things pass your lips thing. Yes. You know, and you, yes. you know to try to speak to people when you are angry or spiteful or or cross. It, it, that's not the kind of communication you want to land, is it? You, you know, don't want that to... Absolutely. I mean, it's fine to say, would you like a cup of tea? Well, we have this thing about you throw your muck where your love lies. Yes, quite. And so people are very, very polite to folk, apart from their partner. And I have to say, it's much. it can be much easier for your average... Like, I, OK, my experience in the past... Well, it was easy to be nice to people at work. It was to be nice to whoever I was involved with at the time. Um, 
But actually with you, it's not like that anymore. Mind yeah. you, I don't really have people at work anymore because I work from home and I'm, so, so, I'm a solopreneur. It's a funny word. Um, but there is that thing about the intensity in a, a romantic relationship or a marriage where all of these, like all your emotions come to the surface, don't they? And all the, the, the cracks appear and open wide. And Well, for some reason, people, most folk think that they can fill their day, their heads with absolute guff during the course of the day and then go home and discharge it to the person they love most yes. at the end of it. And actually... Why would you want to do that? Well, it, it to, yeah, why would you do that? Because listening to someone having a jolly good moan is entirely not fun at all. No, it's, it's not. It's not fun at all. And, um, you know, some people only have moaning. They don't have good things to and say. They only have was, crumbs. Yeah, and if it was like a five or ten minute brain dump and get the moaning over the way, out of the way and then move on to something a bit more cheerful, that would be different, wouldn't it? But if you've got to be stuck with it all through the whole of dinner... Well, actually, what would probably work would be asking the party's permission and that before you moaned. Yes. And, and for, you know, that's really interesting because the loving thing is, oh, I'm supposed to be concerned about you and your welfare at any time of the day or night yes. and be available for this stuff. And, you know, a good relation, I guess I am, we are available. Yes, of course we are. But but before I get to that emergency care package, you know, I don't really want to turn you into my carer. Okay. You're my lover. You're really true about that. And I, I, I kind of know I'm reflecting on it. There's a difference between coming to somebody or coming to your lover because you need a hug or you need some soft words mm. and just coming to them and just dumping. It's like you've just done a shit on the, on the kitchen floor. Mm. I, I, that's a really nasty metaphor, but it sort of feels like that. Mm. Um, yes. Yes. And, that, and I don't think it's to do with what's being communicated. I think it's to do with the intention behind the communication. And it feels like being used as a receptacle for something it doesn't feel like there's any love in it no i think that's what i'm trying to say yes otherwise there'd be a little bit more sort of thoughtfulness about the matter you know why would you pollute your partner with your yeah. own with your own stuff and i mean pollute i mean you talk about it and talk about the remedies and all that kind of stuff but talking to somebody when you're not on point you know, when you're fragged, when you're frustrated, when you're not making any particular sense to yourself, let alone anyone else. Well, you don't bring that to people you love. You you might take that to a, a friend who can put up with you if you've got good friends who will care for you in that way. But, you know, this is why I think that, you know, I think the wives have been railing against this entire, I've got to be your bloody carer, your housekeeper, your psychologist, mm. your, your nurse. Yeah. You know, the entire service package, and I think that it's just just not possible to do yeah. well and be happy with him. No. It turns you into a service droid. Absolutely. And I, and I just can't, yes. I'm not interested in, in, in doing that to you. And there's something about, again, about, you. Yeah, it's like a patchwork, isn't it? So there's the, the like, you like date night. <laughs> I think every night should be date night if it, in some sort of way, like every day there should be time spent together but I understand if you've got a family you've got young children it can be quite tricky but so you've got your patchwork and you've got your romantic time together maybe go out for dinner or something or just cuddle up in front of the tv or whatever you want to do go down the pub and have a good bop with a band playing um, and then there's some not so wonderful stuff but if you don't have that mixture then then it's like the deck and jekyll and hyde you get an awful lot of hyde and not very much jekyll so we're talking about living consciously here. In, and we're on definitely, that. It's, yeah, definitely. We're talking about knowing that you're in the world, knowing that you have an effect in the world. Yes. You know, um, being careful of your own intellectual or your your mind and your body is acceptable, not too mm -hmm. stinky. Well, and about, also that it's looked after. Like. And looked after. Yeah. And that's your job to do that. Yeah. Not my job. No. Each person's job. Each person's job. <laughs> Each person yeah. has, has the responsibility for their being yeah, and for their effect, actually. Yes. And um, because we're a right temperamental species and intend to kick off over anything, 
this rather gives us an idea of what the, well it, it tells us what happens in relationships that does it not it does you know That's relationships insane. fall to pieces for the most ridiculous ephemeric reasons actually very often the reasons are really they're not even relevant are they no, they're, they're just a focus that's been that's been applied to the discomfort yes. and the discomfort is not actually with the relationship but act per se it's a discomfort with the other party which actually reflects the discomfort in itself that's cool. and that's yeah. that's what we we noticed yeah not. definitely yes. now, i'm going to blame you for feeling like shit but i felt shit like first you know it's a it's just yes it's um it's a diversion actually it's a diversion or it's a I was thinking of my parents where almost all the conflict revolved around money mm. and it I just think money was a it was standing in for the real issue and because they never got past the money argument they never got to the real issues and actually this is a quote this is, this is a chart well it's it, okay we've been talking for about 11 minutes if anyone's out there please could you put something in the comments so we know you're there because otherwise we'll still think we're talking to the void um anyway what's i saying so oh yes so the issues are oh, it's quite complicated and i'm going to have to really simplify things but to quote um the lovely thor's new newly invented word almost well, new to me isops so any issue is also an opportunity, and this is what ISOPs means, issues and opportunities. And if you get to the actual real issue, underlying issue, then that's an opportunity for growth and healing and discovery and all to those do that, kinds of things. To do that, you have to have two diagnostic minds working on it. You can't have one diagnostic mind and the other one just busy being fruitcake. There needs to be two quite level examinations in this, in this dissection. Probably yeah, that, that's going to be easier if you've got two diagnostic. Well, yes, because you, you've got you, you, you know your diagnosticing means you're taking it to pieces carefully so you can see its build and you can see where its imbalance might be. Yeah, right. I do wonder whether that can also happen with one one person starting to see things in a different way and starting to change and finding different ways of relating to their partner. So do you reckon that then mirroring will occur? Um, mirroring or like, okay, if we go back to the example of Chip and Jan, Chip and Jan, remember Chip and Jan? Yeah. So Chip, this is Chip Chipman, who when he and he's, I think their child is about two years old. Uh, this is a million decades ago now. Um, they were at the point of close close to divorce i think that's the case and jan discovered something that made her realize that all she needed to do was stop playing chips games um she she went to, she found out about the three principles and she began to understand how her experience was created from inside herself rather than chip kind of pouring it in and then chip says well i realized that she wasn't responding the way she normally did and she was just like Maureen, the fact that I was trying to not wind her up. And I thought, oh, it won't last. It'll blow over in a couple of weeks and we're back to how we were before. And he was wrong. And in the end, he came to see what she had seen. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Because up to, up to, we can clearly see he's the aggressor because he's the one who's doing all the poking. Yeah. All right. She might be doing passive aggressive over she there. Might, we don't know what she was doing. But he's the aggressor. And what used to happen is she would mirror his stance. Or maybe and she fought back. I not if she yeah, mirroring would be fighting back anyway, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. So she's fighting back, mirroring yeah. his stance. Yeah. What then she did is she read a book and upgraded her head and found an entirely new set of tactics with which to handle this temperamental bloke that she was managing at the time. Which and is, then yeah. he began to mirror her. And I gather that took about three weeks. I don't remember. I, I think within two or three weeks, he, he'd realised that. Or maybe it was a week. I can't remember. I don't remember the details of the story. On an on the, on a intimate connection like that, I think the mirroring, when it can be clearly seen as an upgrade, mirroring happens quite quickly. You know, people, yeah. ju people just adjust. What they have to see is a reflection that they'd like to be with. Oh, I do remember what happened. Do you want to know what happened? So he says that it was morning and... Their son, I think it was the son, was playing on the floor. 
and Jan was on the floor with their son playing with him mm -hmm. and um, he saw, he said how he described it, he said I saw Summer streaming in through the window onto her hair and I suddenly, I think he probably remembered that he loved her, I'm not sure, entirely sure how he describes that, it's on a podcast I did with him, I'll, I'll put I'll put their link to the podcast in the comments afterwards. Um, but it was just, a, it's like a kind of a moment of sudden insight. Well, actually, we could call it a moment of clarity. Well, it is, yes. Yeah, we could see, actually saw what a jammy bugger he was and what a lovely life he actually had, and what a temperamental old bag he was. He <laughs> noticed these things and, you know, fair play. Yeah, exactly. Fair play, mate. You know, if you're yeah. going to step up your game, yeah. you first have to notice. And they're still married. Well, and, yeah. I think they're in their 70s, I would like to guess. And he said to me, um, once he said to me once, Oh, I go to bed with a different woman every night. And I said, sorry? And he said, because I see something different in Jan every day. Because he's looking. Because he's looking, he's because, present. Because that's how you stay in love with people. I think so, you, yes. You, you're, you actually are conscious of your association. With them. Is he grumpy with anything else in his world? Has this just moved out from his personal relations I to the whole story? I suspect that he has, he's as grumpy in the same way that other people are grumpy. As but in I, temperamental? I think he's just a normal human being, but mm. I don't. I, I, my impression is that he has a lovely life and he gets on well with his children, his grandchildren. So, and... could it be summarized that he doesn't get grumpy for long? Probably, you see, that for me is yeah. the goal. I mean, this man, he's the direct inheritor of Sydney Banks's. I mean, he has all Sydney Banks's um recordings and writings and things. He's got the like the Sydney Banks Library, which he took over when Sid died, and well, I forget what I was going to say, I've lost my thread. Um, For uh, those who don't know, Sydney Banks is this total genius welder bloke we in Canada. Him? We did, but you know, it's just such well, a good yeah. such a good story. And he's a welder. And <clears throat> he goes to a psychological conference where there's full of psychs, and he says, I'm anxious, and the psych turns to him and says, insecure, insecure. You know, you just think you're insecure, mate. Yeah. And he goes, oh, yeah. first insight. That's right, first insight. And then he goes back to his job, which is making things up with metal. <laughs> and he recognizes that not only is he making things up here, he's making things up in his entire life. In his head. In his head. And he reducts that knowledge, that data, into its tr the truth of it, which is there's all his... The sitcom around the bloody thing whether it's a sitcom whether it's a horror whether it's a comedy and then there's actually the moment that happened and he's a my understanding is that he's able to see through the fiction of his own drama and into the reality of it have i missed the point entirely um, no, i'm not um you've you've just kind of condensed the story and that's fine and <laughs> He he just he just realised that we don't experience things directly. Anything we only experience our our kind of um, internal model of whatever it might be. So our response to it. So it's even the thing, and this is true anyway from neuroscience. When you look at something, you look out at like I'm looking at my garden. There's like a passive inflow of data from my garden. I've got a model inside my head. And it's just, it doesn't matter whether it's looking or seeing or thinking or feeling or concepts, they're all internally generated. Which lets reality off the hook. He, he, I don't want to say that because it doesn't, it's not, a, it's not an excuse to behave badly. However, what it's saying and what it does is it gets you off the hook of thinking that you know, we have gone so far away from the subject of communication, but it does not matter, it's all good. It gets you off the hook of thinking that your current experience is a direct result of something that happened in your past, because actually it's whatever you're feeling, like say what you're feeling now, is, is a direct response to what you're thinking about the stuff that happened to you in the past. Otherwise, I would not, so, if I think about Andy's death, it doesn't make me cry anymore. But if this wasn't true, I would still be crying. 
when I think about Andy's death because there'd be no change. Because Andy's death hasn't changed. It's never going to change, is it? Because there's that intervening um, stage, if you like, of the, the way you experience through your thinking. And your th so you recognise via this but really quite Buddhist type stuff. It is very Buddhist. That you were making up your, your own grief. Yeah, of course. Because we all create grief differently. From it. Like my sister and I, when my father died, we had very different ways of grieving. Mm. The same death, the same man who died. Mm. Nothing different. Um, so, but we had very different responses. And my other sister, because I have two sisters, we all three had different responses to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so obviously, obviously in that case, it has to be the case that the feelings we experienced are a response to the kind of experience that we created within our minds. Did this reveal the way each of you loved him? Um, did it, re did it reveal something it, of your I love style? I think it did, actually, because mm -hmm. um, the sister I'm talking about was very, very close to my father, probably more so than the other. Yeah, me and the other sister. And yeah, it's like you said so many times, Mark, the, the more you love, the more you grieve. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. And maybe it's about the difference in our relationships, relationships with him as well. Well, it will have to do with our relationship with love. It does. There's so, I mean, if you think about it, there are so many things that happen in our life that are going to have an impact on that kind of experience. You know, previous losses and yes. other relationships and all sorts of things. So the more, is it fair to suggest more developed consciousness will have a more level overview of both love and death, as in to manage not to be totally driven mad by either? I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to. I don't, wouldn't want to say that. The only thing that I would say is that if you know the jam jar metaphor, you cannot see the label when you're inside the jar. If you have the ability to step outside of that jar, yeah, just to sort of just just kind of become like a third person in your own in your own circumstance, in yeah. your own in the end, in, in your, your own in your own mentality. Yeah, well, I think that's entirely brilliant. Yeah, so that that's the observer self. So. If you've got good access to your observer self, yeah, I would have thought it would make it easier because you'd have less of the kind of the, the whole Buddhist thing of the the two darts or the two arrows. That the first dart is the thing that happened, like the death or the the broken leg or whatever, and the second dart is all the thinking that builds up more suffering on top of the first suffering. So I think when you can step outside of your jam jar or whatever jar it is, it might be pickles. Um, <laughs> You step outside your jar and you start to see that what's on the label, mm. you can say, Oh my god, this is what I'm experiencing. This is, yes. So it's awareness of awareness, isn't it? Yes, and I, I do like the jar metaphor because as you pull back from a situation mm -hmm. and you look, and then suddenly you realize there's not just one jam jar, there are millions of jam jars. And millions of jam jars are having, and you know, everybody dies, it's not an exclusive club. So Every one of those jam jars is going to be de dealing with yes, these common yes. these common crises, these common misunderstandings. And if you think about it, I mean, you know, if there's eight billion people on the planet that might correspond to eight billion jars, well, but actually, probably you could also say, well, there's a jar for every relationship. Why not? And I mean, then it starts to multiply and be beyond my ability to, to even imagine. So. Well, I think this this is what gets us into the grand interconnectedness of all things. Yes. Because everyone ha is a jar. They also have a jar. Sometimes they're vaguely open. There's a load of other jars out there. All the jars are going through the same experience. They're all going through the yes. same death, fear, terror, horror, loss, all loneliness. Too many, too many sweets. Probably the vast majority mm -hmm. uh, do not do not have the ability or have never considered the possibility of stepping outside of their own jar. Is this because we love the thrill of being in that ignorance? No, I don't know. I think that the only thing that tips us out into a development is getting fed up of that vulgar energy disrupting our day every every minute. Of oh, it. I see what you mean. And you suddenly realise that I am sick to death of having this incredibly stormy mind. 
with all of its squalls yes, and thunderstorms. Yes. I would like to have something a bit more oh, look, level. We have somebody watching. Colleen. Oh, Colleen Knight. Uh, you can't see the label anymore. Yeah, absolutely, Colleen. You can't. Yeah. So, what's on your label? <laughs> yeah. So, thank you for being here. Yeah. So, that leveling thing is personally what helped me uh, to manage my own turmoil, is realizing that the world's full of the damn stuff. You know, why don't you just... Oh, yes, it's just normal parts yes, just, just un unplug the kettle for a bit. Yes. Wait for it to calm down a bit. And, and you know, the, mm. that whole, again, going back to Sid Banks, that whole mm. metaphor of, the, of it being a, life being a game, like any other game, you're going to get hurt. You know, you... And I keep banging on about football lately, even though I don't much enjoy watching it. But if you're a, fo if you're a footballer and you injure yourself, all you want to do is get back... You know, get get over your injury, get recover, and get back in into the game again. But sometimes it seems with people they think, oh, you know, it shouldn't be so fair. I shouldn't have got hurt, and I, I hate this life. And um, that you, it's like just appreciate that being human, you're going to get hurt. It's just normal. But you have a magic kiss and you can kiss it better and you have a magic kiss yes absolutely you, you know this is yeah. the, you know we, we come here for a moment in eternity and we certainly don't want to die of boredom do we we just don't no. and this is why we have leather trousers and harleys and jack daniels you and, might, and all those other wonderful distractions and yes you can hurt yourself on these things yes you can you can yes. but but without them it would be like long wouldn't it i mean you know yeah that's There'd be nothing going on if there wasn't excitement. So maybe every hurt is another ISOP. Yes. ISOP. Yes. So long as one knows how to step back from the hurt, that's actually quite helpful. Well, again, getting outside of your jam jar. Yeah. Or whatever kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. jar yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. 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 Listen, we're nearly finished. We've got three minutes left. Do you want to bring on the gorgeous Harriet to say hello to the people out there? Only for the softy wafties who have a thing about hairs. My lot, my companion of the last seven years. <laughs> Harriet the Hair. <laughs> and for those of you who don't already know, Mark is a master at the art of making it seem like the hair is actually talking to <laughs> you. It's all right, Harriet. <sighs> Colleen might be watching, but I doubt anyone else is. That's the point. No, it's right. We don't mind talking to the void because it doesn't bloody answer back, does That's it, Harriet? Joke. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. And and I did want to point out to everyone that Her Harriet is not a puppet. She's a proper soft toy. The kind that you throw at the parents of children when you want the child to laugh so you can take a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and she's an excellent communicator. And she never talks back. She just makes you feel really good inside yourself. Don't you, Harriet? <laughs> So well, the last thing I wanted to say before we wind up, or wrap up even, mm -hmm. is um, I think it was George Pransky, no, Jack Pransky, oh, it doesn't matter, one or the other, George Pransky, who said, <laughs> bye, Harry, if you are going to communicate with your partner, bear in mind that it's a bit like a water pipe. If you're doing communication from a, what you would call a low mood, when you're cross, or depressed or whatever it's like pouring contaminated water down the water pipe and it won't taste very nice when it arrives at the other end so it's better to use your water pipe with clean water which comes through and you're in a high mood i quite like his, his thing of high mood and low mood because it's just like just let's not get into the fine minutiae of different kinds of mood just try not to talk to people when you're totally grumpy. Yes. That's, it's that's just a really doing. good thing because you yeah. don't need that stuff in your relationships. Okay. And um, and then you can come back and talk about how funny it was to not talk to people when you were being grumpy. Because they they don't like it, you know. They want to know, are you all right? And when I get grumpy, I say to you, Mark, am I grumpy? And you say, well, you're a bit. Hmm. And actually that seems to help me to step outside of my jar. So that's pretty good enough. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, it's a balancing, very, isn't it? It's very yeah. lovely to me when I'm grumpy. Well, it's just high maintenance, genius level, top top shelf, everything. <laughs> Thoroughbred. Thoroughbred. Exactly. Like We're both sensitive characters. And you hide it better than I do. I'm just a little spinulated. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, actually. 
I don't think you really realise just how opinionated you can be sometimes. Also, you don't have such a bad case of large roditis as I do. <laughs> right, it's time to finish. So um, from Mark and from me and from the lovely Harriet over there, it's goodbye from us and it's goodbye from her. Bye. Bye.